Thank you for downloading this episode of Case Notes. Case Notes was recorded at the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh. Visit our website to find out about our latest events. And please support us and help us to reach new audiences by liking, following, or leaving a comment on whatever podcast platform you are listening on. We hope you enjoy the talk. I think my interest in Burns, well, it started in lots of different ways, really. So I I originally came from Canada, and uh, one of the few hospitals in Birmingham that I'd ever heard of before was the Accident Hospital, and I'll mention that in the talk. The the Birmingham Accident Hospital had an international reputation for the work it did in terms of fracture care, but in Burns care as well. So to end up there and to start researching the history of medicine and um, in 2011, I organized a conference in Birmingham on skin, and I was saying to Daisy earlier that uh, it's a shame that we published the proceedings of the conference with, uh, with one publisher who gave up the series from this historical association, and then they started, this, the historical association took this series to another publisher, and they didn't want to promote the other sort of uh, publisher's uh, volumes. So that sort of book that I really enjoyed working on, and I think is a really important one that links up nicely with your, your exhibition, uh, is, is pretty hard to find. So what I, well, I'm sort of just glad that you recognize that I did something on skin, and that I was invited to speak here. And, and I happen to be working on a, on a... So there's some problems with this slide, but I think we've managed to sort them out. So I will tell you in some cases what used to be on the slide. Some of the images have disappeared. And this is, this is my team. Um, for five years, we were looking at the history of burns, and the project was called Forged by Fire, because I think this is, again, you may disagree with me, but I think looking at British history and knowing, having worked in all these different areas, there's something about the way that burns and burns injuries and fire brings together sort of important moments in British history. And you can almost say that those 200 years, Britain was forged by fire, whether it's industrial history. Um, We put together the grant and the HRC obviously liked it and we got our money for five years. And I still didn't feel that they understood what we meant, that there were moments when our Iconic fires make people think about burns and injury in different ways and fire in different ways. And then about seven months into the project, uh, of course, we had the disaster uh, at Grenfell. And I think that's when people realize that if anybody ever says cladding again, the whole meaning around that word has changed because we've gone through a moment like that. So that project is all about those sort of moments in British history. And so it brings together Shane Ewan, who's sitting in in that group there, and Rebecca Winter and and Aaron Andrews at Leeds Beckett, and I'm, of course, based in Birmingham. And we couldn't possibly do 200 years, and as you see, I've I've bit off more than I can chew so many times before looking at the big picture. But so we decided to focus on Birmingham, Glasgow, and London for the project, but we we hone in on particular places. Actually, before, before I leave at the end, make sure I brought some graphic novels along as well because we published some, some stories that we found in the archives in graphic format. And anybody who's interested can have one because uh, I think, I think uh, you'll want to see the local stories in particular. And there's an Edinburgh story in there as well. So we looked at these iconic moments and how burns, whether they were um, caused by war or working in the home or during a leisure event like the Bradford Stadium fire or the King's Cross fire or a theater fire in, in Edinburgh at the beginning of the uh, 20th century, that these were moments when people start, started to change the way they did things, and not just health and safety, but they designed homes, buildings, they educated people differently, and medicine, of course, took strides forward. Something that we're not doing in the book, um, which is being written at this very moment, is looking specifically at scars. They come up in a chapter that we're writing about survivors. But to talk about burn scars tonight gave me an opportunity to kind of think about how burn scars figured within this longer story that we're, we're working on. So in terms of the justification on the project, I, I think, I mean, we're coming, you were saying about this used to be a very different 
event before COVID, and COVID has also, like burns and fire, shaped the way we, we live now. Uh, some people will continue to wear masks, but people are hesitant to maybe come out in large groups. But I do think that we've recognized that about epidemics for a long time, and there's something about accidents that we haven't as historians, but I don't think they're really recognized as these important shaping events. And they're everywhere. If you think about everybody's experienced an accident, but of course you would contextualize them and, and write about them very differently from infectious diseases. But I think there need to be more histories of falls and, uh, and drownings and, uh, and motor vehicle accidents. But what we're trying in this project is to sort of look at one accident that we thought was unique. And you may disagree with me here, but I think they're, they're interesting for many reasons that the sociologist Irving Goffman, when he was writing in the, in the 60s and 70s, referred to the, the stigmata of Burns, which when he brings it up first in his text, Stigma, he refers to those slaves that were branded uh, in, uh, in, in the ancient world. But this word stigmata, of course, is referring to the, the marks of, of, of Jesus having been on the cross. But So there's these religious connotations that follow Burns throughout its history, that people, people imagine it, I guess, um, as the worst possible death, maybe because it invokes ideas of hell. But there's something about Burns that makes it stand out from other uh, accidents. And it's, it's particularly stigmatizing, but people can also talk about heroic Burns. So I want to touch on all of these points in the talk. Um, so then many of these scars are characteristic of war, for example, war injuries. but I think experiencing this kind of injury in war is very different from experiencing one uh, in the home or um, depending on whether you're elderly or whether you're a child and grow up with this for the rest of your life. Um, I'll talk a bit about how coroners recognized burns and, and what caused them. And, and there's some stories from Scotland in there as well, some famous um, um, medical, uh, um, sorry, uh, forensic uh, medical people in, in Edinburgh and, and other cities as well. Um, and I'll look at, I'll finish with maybe some of the people and stories that you're more familiar with, but I want to make an argument about even today the way we sort of present burns and scars from burns um, is quite contentious and we maybe don't even see how contentious it is because of two very different approaches taken by, by the leading burns charities in this country. Um, so again, it, it is not all historic, but this project is just sweeping. So I'm giving you a, a taste from sort of 1800 to, uh, to, to the present day. Now why I started um, the project in 1800 is because the very first book on Burns in the English language um, came out, and that's Edward Kentish's Essay on Burns, so published in 1797. Again, 1800 sounds better on the grant application. In 1797, but they're roughly about, you know, this is where our story starts. And he proposed a new way of treating burns, uh, one that I would certainly not recommend anybody try, but he believed that solvents were best to treat burns. So something like turpentine. Um, and it fit in very well with the thinking at the time in terms of the humors of the body. And, uh, and somebody around the same time proposed that burns be treated with water, and it simply didn't fit with the way that people had or thought about the body and medicine at this time. Um, it's unique also because it's, it's the first book in English, but he didn't focus on uh, soldiers, which a lot of previous works on the continent had done. Uh, and by civilians, what Kentish really meant, uh, because he was originally trained and working in Newcastle, he meant miners. And he eventually ended his career in Bristol and he was working for a workhouse. Again, his, what he has to say about skin in general is fascinating, but I'm only going to look at burns. <clears throat> but he had lots to say about the itch and ulcers and other sort of skin diseases that would have been far more prevalent back then. And of course, mine shafts were going deeper and deeper, and the inflammable uh, gases that were collecting were leading to explosions, and he was writing about um, people injured in these sorts of workplace uh, accidents, but he also has a lot of anecdotes about other medic medical practitioners. There's a bit of self-experimentation. People are looking for a way to, to cure what is seen as one of the iconic injuries of the industrial period. Um, so again, the problem was is that everybody had a recipe 
for treating burns. So what they're trying to do in these early works is decide what is the best way to treat them. And he's saying that there's nothing else in medicine quite like burns that everybody, whether, whether you're in sort of Bristol, you might recommend butter. In, a, in most mining communities, they're recommending flour. Uh, in the American South, they're recommending cotton. Uh, but everybody has their own Burns remedy. And I think that kind of continues today. Uh, you may all remember Burns remedies, and some of them, of course, are probably going to be trialed clinically. And honey, for example, seems to show uh, um, possibilities. But honey was used for, for um, quite some time in, in treating Burns. I think this is an important moment to mention because in the 19th century, in the middle 19th century, medical, the medical profession in Britain is professionalizing. They're um, trying to sort of create a single portal for qualification, and new journals are starting to appear. This particular journal started in, uh, in the Midlands and would become uh, the British Medical Journal. But um, the president at the time in the 1840s suggested this was the first time that everybody was connected in this sort of way across Britain, that maybe they should have an annual question or or challenge that they could put to all their members to improve one aspect of, um, of treatment in medicine. And for the purposes of our project, we, I was very pleased to find out, which nobody had mentioned before, was that the Provincial Medical and Surgical Association chose Burns as that first topic that really needed all of these medical practitioners connected through their new society to sort of pool their knowledge and try and come up with the best possible treatment. And, they published these 12 questions that they wanted everybody to sort of write in with. And, and uh, there, were, there were a few references to scars there that people were making casts of um, patients disfigured by burns. And sadly, none of those have survived. But I just thought, what an amazing resource that they were trying to, to compile here. And they were asking questions about sort of uh, who, who was having more success. Was it the hospitals or general practitioners? Um, you can see there's lots of, lots of different things they were investigating. The best first aid, what should they tell the public to do, and what should the medical practitioners do? When they talk about um, burn scars, you can see that they want to cure the burn as early as possible because they otherwise felt there was very little they could do for people with burn scars. So um, in one of the articles, uh, a medical practitioner from... Gloucester basically summed up that he'd heard of one case where somebody who'd been severely burned, um, a woman named Ann Jones. Um, sadly, the records of the Gloucester Infirmary don't exist anymore, so he couldn't follow this case up. But he does write enough. Uh, 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 he referred to an article where her case was written up in the medical surgical notes and illustrations. And you can see the biggest challenge was after sort of separating the skin, the chin had fused to the chest, and she was drooling and, and life was generally difficult and obviously it attracted a lot of attention. In order to cure this, um, they had to somehow keep her head elevated and she had to wear what sounded like a very uncomfortable collar. And um, very few people could tolerate this kind of lengthy treatment. And this is one of the problems with burns is that burns were regularly requiring far longer treatment. If they were going into hospital, they took months to heal. Um, other patients were spending days uh, following accidents in hospital. So again, the length of time required to cure burns, but um, simply trying to keep a contracture like that um, in the, the position after surgery, post-surgery, was very, very difficult. And uh, um, one of the medical practitioners who was uh, connected to the Provincial Medical and Surgical uh, Journal said they had never seen a case like this cured, but he'd seen many attempted. So I think part of the story really is, is that uh, once you were burned and you had your sort of scars and your contractures, whether it disfigured your arm, your face, it was something that was very difficult to deal with for, for much of the 19th century. Uh, even the leading surgeons like Bransby Cooper, who took over uh, Apsley Cooper's um, uh, practice in London and his post at uh, Guy's and Thomas's. He said he saw many cases like this. He had attempted a cure himself. Um, again, the apparatus that the child that he was operating on um, was required to wear was simply too painful. The, the, the whole procedure drawn out that uh, eventually um, 
treatment um, had to cease. And uh, he, the only good he could draw from the whole experience was that, well, at least the lips had been restored, so the child was no longer drooling, but clearly the child had left London, presumably moved somewhere in maybe a rural location where they drew less attention. But uh, these sorts of images that uh, accompanied the article um, were becoming more and more common. In fact, I think there's, there's, there's dozens of versions like them in the, the Lancet and the, the, uh, the, the Scottish journals as well. And usually it, it's uh, to describe sort of the most melancholy of, of accident cases. Um, one that, uh, um, just to show you that when there is a breakthrough and the difference it could make when um, surgery uh, is becoming more successful in the second half of the 19th century, um, the autobiography of Reverend Joseph uh, Townend, who was a, a, a Methodist missionary, eventually went to Australia, but uh, he, was, uh, he was burned as a child in Manchester. Um, he, the, the, I guess the family doctor, a local doctor, originally pronounced it a fatal case, but his mother um, encouraged treatment. Um, he stopped treatment, but then for the, the following year, he was about five years old at the time, she continued to treat him at home, and eventually he recovered. Um, his, his right arm was fused to his side, so again, like the people who had their chins stuck to their chests. Um, he, uh, he found life difficult, but he still managed to work in a textile factory. Uh, and his autobiography that he wrote, obviously, at the end of his career is, I think, an overlooked, one of the, the most important patient narratives from the 19th century, where he describes in detail what he had to go through. And in fact, the entire operation that nobody wanted to perform because of the lack of success previously um, was a, a result of him going to his uh, employer when he was 21 years old and saying, you are a subscriber to the local hospital. Can you please admit me? And then he, once he was admitted or once he had a moment to be consulted by the medical staff there, he, um, he insisted that they operate, but they didn't want to operate. Eventually, they gave in. Um, and then you see this amazing transformation in hospital as sort of, I think it's almost identical to the sort of biographies you see written now, whether um, by James Partridge or the, you know, the activists and founders of Burns Charities were, but I see the role of religion, uh, the religion plays in his recovery is, is, is huge. But you can see that gradually in the sort of Victorian period, I think the context is slightly different. Um, he's uh, he's uh, back with his sweetheart when he's out of hospital. Um, he's, he's promoted in his work. He buys himself a new suit. Um, you see a full recovery. Um, and, uh, and eventually, she's not supporting him anymore, but he's able to support her, and she um, accepts um, his request um, of marriage. So again, you can see this, this life transformed, but it's such a rare early... Uh, success story in terms of um, uh, operating on a on a severe burn that uh, that I think we're going to have it play a large role in the in the in the book so skin grafting of course um, th there's a, a major breakthrough just after um, just after town town end has his uh, operation there's uh, there's success by first a surgeon in Paris, a Swiss-born surgeon who eventually goes back to Geneva, Reverdin, uh, Jean-Jacques Reverdin. He develops the pinch graft. So again, I've put an image that's from the experiments done at the the Glasgow Burns Unit from the the 50s and 60s, where if you if you know the sort of uh, history of transplant surgery uh, in that Burns Unit, uh, the pinch grafts were um, what uh, Tom uh, Gibson and, uh, and Peter Medawar observed when, uh, when they published their article about um, immune responses. And of course, that would win Medawar the, the Nobel Prize, of recognizing that the pinch grafts from the individual themselves weren't, uh, uh, weren't uh, rejected, but those that came from the patient's brother um, were rejected. So again, lots of people working in Burns units were far more interested in uh, infection so it was very easy to miss that sort of other kind of uh, bodily response uh, in this sort of research. But anyway, the grafting really took off in the 1870s, 1880s, uh, and you see a lot more success in treating burn scars from this point on. Uh, so people were trying the pinch graft, 
that Ravardin introduced. And I think they're quite interesting because they're transferable scars. You might take that graft from the individual themselves, but lots of donors were the parents, for example, and, um, and that scar would then be transferred to other people. And I think that makes, again, burn scars quite unique, that this accident which results in a bodily scar is then shared more widely. And people who donate skin, of course, would, would also be scarred. Uh, a lot of the failures that they were um, experiencing led to animal skin being used. So there's a, an unwritten history, really, about um, the sort of xenotransplantation that um, there's, if you look at, if you do a search of newspapers in this country, for example, people were using puppies, they were using pigeon skin. There was a huge moment of experimentation between 18, uh, sorry, 1870 and 1914, where you even have descriptions of children in hospital with, um, with a, a dog in, this, in the same bed because they have to be sutured together for the purposes of transplanting uh, skin. So you see lots of stories of, of animal skin being used. And of course, animals, I think there's no other sort of aspect in the history of medicine where animals are so involved. I've put the frog skins here because there's a famous story that's described in The Lancet from 1884 where the parents didn't want to donate skin to the badly burned child. But then the doctor had an idea that there were a lot of frogs out in that season. So the parents were sent out to collect frogs and they decided to transplant the frog skin. And the article says they had great success, but of course, they had success usually just covering the wounds, and it gave the wounds some time to heal, as the tissue, of course, over top was slowly being destroyed by the immune response. And sometimes that's all that was needed, because that would stop the infection a lot of the time as well, if the skin was carefully cleaned as well. But they'd been using animal products to treat burns from ancient times, uh, from the medieval period, you have lots of discussions of bear's grease being used, for example. And then eventually they're using animal skin. And of course, we know that animals are used extensively in, in, uh, in testing um, sort of uh, research in burns today. So whether it's the rabbit ear, or as you can see in the slide here, lots of mice and rats used uh, in, in the experiments in the later 20th century as well. But again, I think with the move towards one medicine and the history of medicine, I think we're picking up more and more the sort of role that animals have played in the, in the wider history of medicine. So as I said, there's something really interesting about the way that um, the transfer of skin or skin donors leads to the scar being shared more widely when it comes to burns. And I mentioned Revardin, his pinch grafts. Um, again, Tiersch, uh, recommended a split thickness um, uh, skin graft, which was most of the epidermis and, uh, sorry, the, the dermis and part, a very thin layer of the epidermis, saying that there was less scar. If these sorts of grafts were used, and I should mention Wolf as well. So John Wolf was a, a, a Glasgow practitioner. Um, fascinating character, actually, who disappears from the history of medicine because he decides to fight in the national uh, wars in Europe at this time as well, but is recognized today for the sort of full thickness grafts that he introduced, and he was doing a lot of work, and I think is one of the founders of the Glasgow Ophthalmic Institution. And this, uh, the woman's uh, portrait there, and I'm not sure if that's a local dress, but it looks to me like she's probably a, a foreign patient as well. You can see he's used a a, a, a graft to reconstruct uh, around a burn that was near her eye. Um, but again, how was the skin harvested? Well, there's sometimes it was just a razor, and then by the 20th century, you have all the more um, successful dermatomes, the Humby knife, for example, and then eventually electric dermatomes where you can simply harvest skin. And of course, today, they're making all sorts of composites, and uh, there were different ways. So these, the dermatome that I'm showing here is a mesh dermatome, so it would cut the, the skin in a mesh form, and a lot of the patterns, the scars that would result was as a result of this webbed sort of pattern. Taking a little bit of skin and the mesh dermatome would allow you to stretch it and cover a larger part of the body because that's one of the problems. When you have a burns patient, um, they don't always have enough skin to, to cover all of the burns. So, But uh, it makes for very interesting patterns if you look at some of the, the medical uh, um, uh, texts at this time. Um, a burn scar isn't a burn scar. You don't just see one and, and see them all. 
there, there's, a, there's a whole story to be told in terms of the different knives and dermatomes that were used to harvest skin as well. Now, industrial scarring, um, what's interesting is that there are particular parts of the body um, that are burned in different ways depending on the workplace where someone is when they're burned. So again, um, you can see in the reports of the factory inspectorate that uh, foundries are a particularly hazardous place when it comes to burns, and there are horrific burns where whole ladles of molten metal are um, accidentally dropped on, uh, on workers. But most often, when people are sort of holding a ladle, um, they might pour some of the, uh, the molten metal on, a, on moist ground, which leads to almost like an explosion and pieces of metal flying through the air. Uh, like bullets, leaving very deep wounds. But most often it seems that people uh, working in foundries scarred um, their legs. So you can imagine how easily they might pour the molten metal uh, either into their own boots or somebody else's. So you see in, in collections of, of illustrations, um, often these kinds of illustrations. This is from the Wellcome Trust's archive. Um, and a lot of workers uh, in foundries were not even lacing their boots because it was so common to, uh, to have metal go down the boot that by not lacing their boots, they could get out of them more quickly. Now, of course, the protective equipment has developed much more further and, uh, and you have sort of the Velcro straps and they can get out of these boots much more quickly. I've, I've included two other images in there because I'm very grateful to the Falkirk Historical Society. When I was locked down during uh, COVID, um, it was, I wanted to go up and look at the archives uh, uh, related to the, um, the Karen Ironworks and uh, some of their members had done a lot of work there and they very generously sent me um, anything I needed from the history that was being written on the, the Karen Ironworks. And Karen oil was the most popular treatment for burns throughout the 19th century. And clearly the name suggests there's a connection to the, um, to the foundry, but uh, I, I've not found the original sort of recipe or reference to when this, uh, when this oil was produced. I have to say, because I'm up in, in Scotland, but when you research burns <laughs> in Scotland, it's really difficult because of your national poet. I'll tell you, when you actually start to, all you end up getting is all these, how many burn societies there are, um, and worldwide as well. But uh, again, we, it, we didn't give up. So uh, interesting is that the very first patient to be admitted into the Falkirk Infirmary, not surprisingly, was a, was a Burns patient and had, had uh, injuries like, uh, like this on their right foot. And the, again, the chemical industry, all part of the, that big boom in the second industrial revolution. So from the 1850s and 60s, you have these new industries from railroads, uh, but the chemical industry also developing. And of course, um, you can see just by the individual there, very, uh, very dangerous position right there on a vat that had probably a caustic soda or an acid in there. Um, people regularly falling into these uh, baths, um, splashing themselves. You have lots of references to eye burns. So again, ophthalmologists far more involved in, in treating burns as a result of the development of the, the chemical industry. But this fatalism prevailed for the longest time that very few people um, bothered to introduce protective equipment. And what you see, which we hadn't heard of before, is that one of the very first accident hospitals was opened in Widnes as a, as a result in 1878. And then people started to sort of, their attention was drawn to the damage that the chemical industry was doing to the workers in this book that Robert uh, Sherrard, uh, Sherrard had written, The White Slaves of England. But what's also clear is that out of all the other industries, this was one that wasn't just scarring the workers, but was scarring the landscape. And you really see the birth of the environmental movement as a result, and people still sort of writing about the sort of the damage done to the, the landscape in, uh, in, uh, in the area around uh, Runcorn and, and Widnes uh, and, and, and other chemical areas, or areas where the chemical industry was, was, uh, was developing. But I thought it's quite interesting that we can talk about a, a scorched or scarred landscape as well as the bodies of, of workers. Um, so most of the time, if you wear your protective equipment, or, or at least people could see that if you were wearing certain clothing, your scars and your burns would also have particular patterns to them. One of the most interesting um, uh, articles that I found during the project was by Michael Tempest, who was 
uh, a burn specialist at the Chepstow uh, um, Burns Unit, which was at the St. Lawrence Hospital. It was uh, set up during the Second World War, and um, eventually the, the, the National Burns Unit in Wales would move to, uh, to Swansea. But for the longest time, uh, some of the most interesting research work was coming out of this, this unit at Chepstow. And you could see that uh, based on the sort of burns that they were treating there, they were developing better protective equipment for the miners. So miners are central to the story, not just from 1797 when, when Kentish is writing his, his first book on burns, but uh, right into the, uh, the, the, the uh, later 20th century. So this, is, this, is, this article was post-Second World War. And you could see that gradually the, the, the gloves, the helmets, and all that protective equipment that we would become familiar right around the time when the mining uh, industry was shutting down was as a result of the sort of work that was uh, being done in these burns units. Now, I said I'd touch on uh, reading dead bodies as well. Um, Alfred Swain Taylor is generally seen as the sort of father of um, forensic medicine or medical jurisprudence. Um, one of his uh, books, I just, his, his books on medical jurisprudence went through multiple editions, but I just went through one in detail to sort of show you how he was uh, trying to read the body and scars and burn scars on the body. And he was, of course, using Dupuytren's idea of six degrees of burns. So again, from about four to six, you're talking about destruction of not just all the tissues, but also the bone as well. Um, and he was trying to differentiate between burns that were caused by fire, something burning, versus scalding water. So he said that the skin would often look yellow. And again, recognizing that the new chemicals that were being used industrially and also within the home, that you would have burns caused by those chemicals, which also tended to turn the skin yellow. So it was a very distinct type of scar. Um, but one of the things that really preoccupied the the people writing these books at the time was whether these burns occurred during life or death. So were they looking at somebody who had died as a result of burns or was it a body that just happened to burn or be burned by somebody else who was trying to maybe cover up a, a murder? So you could see some really interesting information being shared in the correspondence between the authors but also in the different volumes. So again, Robert Christensen is just one that I mentioned because um, Alfred Swain Taylor benefited a lot from the experiments that he was conducting on what sounds like maybe aborted children in Scotland who were burned with iron pokers. And of, co of course, most surgeons would have used amputated limbs. So lots of discussions of how long after a, a limb had been amputated, they were able to get a blister to appear. So what they were starting to recognize what, was that a blister caused uh, during life was usually filled with liquid a blister that was caused after death was usually filled with air. So this is something they were trying to clear up, but um, lots of other observations they made about a, a red line that would form around the burn. So um, looking for these signs in order to really um, determine a case, and most people were, were getting this sort of training now as part of their medical education in the middle of the 19th century. So again, having to ensure that they were trained to maybe make that court appearance and to make a a proper judgment in those sorts of cases. Um, again, interesting that Taylor did uh, repeat many of the same uh, experiments that he was being told by his colleagues writing uh, medical jurisprudence texts in Scotland and, and elsewhere um, by conducting these experiments as well. Um, in those textbooks, they also refer to lightning strikes, which seems to fascinate people at this time. And so does spontaneous combustion, but that would disappear from medical jurisprudence textbooks from about the 1860s, 1870s. But uh, lightning strikes, or what they call Lichtenberg figures, are, um, are fascinating if you look at these. So again, how to identify them on a body? Because if you found somebody who had been struck by lightning, it might look like they had been clubbed over the head, or you'd see a, some sort of mark of violence. Um, so much scorching in some cases, but other times more like a, a bullet wound, they said. Um, so at this time, there's not that many cases like this. They're saying there's about two dozen annually that they have to deal with, but um, clearly there are characteristic scars which are left, and usually these were cases that were conducted in spring and summer when the activity is also more common. Um, so again, they mention locations where these scars might be, usually on the head or somewhere like that, but 
the very earliest reference to a Lichtenberg figure is from a Scottish text, actually. And, and he, he didn't recognize this as, a, as a, its own sort of formation. He thought that the tree that the person had been standing next to when they were struck by lightning had almost been sort of superimposed on the body. But that's the sort of way that people uh, describe these scars, that they would be the delineation, a tree-like, an arboreal sort of pattern that appears on the body. And they would eventually be called Lichtenberg figures and were part of physics experiments and are seen in all sorts of different contexts as well, this sort of fractal-like radiating wound. Um, and again, they found that they were much darker and would last longer if somebody was wearing metal. So for example, a belt buckle or a buckle on their shoe or something like that. Um, or if they'd been sweating, so maybe working in a field at the time. Um, but they are, some of the, they are the rarest of scars, but I think a fascinating one that um, continues to be discussed in all the medical jurisprudence textbooks. But uh, most of them were temporary, that they would last for about 24 hours, but long enough to make that sort of correct diagnosis. Um, so this, this is something that hasn't come up as much for the earlier period, but um, again, is very relevant today. And I had, another, I had another image on there, which is, I always like to show these images because I think you know, a, lot of, a lot of children, a lot of elderly, um, in some cases those who, who can't uh, communicate, um, will be abused and, uh, and will wear characteristic scars on their body. So the stocking skulls, which aren't on the slide, are the symmetrical sort of burns that are created when a child is put into hot water and usually sort of um, on purpose dipped into water as punishment. And uh, they're seen regularly in hospitals. And I first see them discussed in about the, the 1960s. Of course, that's just shortly after the modern burns units were set up in uh, Glasgow, in, in Birmingham, in, in London and then eventually in, in other places like Salisbury, Chepstow. But uh, again, uh, interesting discussion, the cigarette burns, which aren't just signs of abuse, but would become part of the subculture. I'm not sure if you considered something like that for the exhibition, but so the age of punk rock brought these uh, unusual badges of honors, particularly, I think, certain bands where their fans had, I think, whether uh, the germs, I think, was one of them. And if you had a burn, a cigarette burn on your left arm, that was a sign that you were a fan of the band. So again, interesting way that burns were used within different subcultures. But again, uh, signs of abuse today, most social workers are trained to recognize these, but um, clearly uh, uh, something that people are picking up when the first social workers are appointed to burns units in the 1960s and 70s. Um, uh, well, yes, and then the other things that people recognized with these sorts of burns, that often children were brought in with these burns, and they, had, they weren't being brought in as an emergency, that most children were usually rushed to hospital, but there were delays in treatment. There were often no witnesses to say exactly how the burns, these very symmetrical burns were caused. Uh, and again, there's a, a much more clear, the modern recognition of, of what causes them now. So we've seen the way that donors can sort of the, the scar is transferable to donors, but there's, these burns are also communicable injuries in terms of, you hear lots of stories. So we've collected thousands of stories from newspapers around the country where it's almost the same story every time. Where, I mean, there was an advantage to living in poor housing, I think, in the 19th century, when people were living much closer to each other and you didn't have the same sort of privacy where somebody shouts out because they were too close to the fire, they were leaning over the mantle to get something and suddenly their shirt's on fire. Somebody screams, it alerts the neighbor, co-workers, whoever. Um, they come in, they grab a coat, a carpet, something at hand and they smother the fire. They usually throw the person on the ground. But in rescuing them, there's often a lot of people being treated like this image. This is the one image I could find. This is the earliest one I could find in the newspapers because there's always a, a photograph of the, the kitchen that's, that's where the fire's been or a child after they've been released from hospital or often just a, a, a picture of the, the house. Um, but here you have an example of somebody who was heralded as a hero but will carry those scars with them. Um, so this idea of the injury, the burns injury in a way that other injuries aren't, is transferred to the person who comes to the rescue. And it's often the hands and arms for obvious reasons in this case. But with acid burns, what you see is that the attacker often also um, becomes 
the victim, if you want to call them the victim, but they, they also are burned. And again, I've put the image of Stefan Silvestri on there, who, um, who th was the acid thrower in the case of Katie Piper um, in, uh, in 2008. And he, of course, had been encouraged to do this by her, her ex-boyfriend. But they eventually found him because he'd gone into another hospital in London claiming that he had these acids spilled on him. But uh, again, acid attackers often end up being burned as well. So you have this, I guess I had, uh, originally before I put his image on there, I had it something called heroic burns. But when I put him on there, it's, you have the hero, but you have, I guess, the villain as well in these stories that, that often take the, uh, the, um, the, the burn. Now this is maybe a story that is more familiar. But uh, in the Second World War, we know that, again, there was a very unique type of burn. They called it the Airman's Burn because the Spitfires and the Hurricanes, most of the fuel tank was right there in front of the pilot. Um, so, and I guess for good reason, lots of pilots' biggest nightmare was to go down in a flamer, as they called it. So many of them were, were horrifically scarred. Um, but again, because of where they went down in the Battle of Britain and ending up in salt water was maybe a good thing and taken to East Grinstead Hospital, where Archie McIndoe was, uh, was conducting his, his surgery. Uh, many of them, of course, had, had not worn their safety equipment. They felt that they could fly better with, without their gloves. And as a result, he dealt with uh, burns that showed very clearly who was wearing the protective equipment, who wasn't wearing their goggles, who wasn't wearing um, what had been designed to keep them safe. So 649 members eventually of what they called themselves the guinea pig club, and, uh, and I think it's an important transformative moment in the way that, um, that, that scars were really understood, burn scars were understood um, internationally in, in many respects because a Canadian unit was set up there and, and uh, surgeons from around the world came to work with the surgeons at East Grinstead. Uh, he wasn't a psychologist, but he had a very interesting way of sort of encouraging the recovery of these, these uh, pilots so that uh, they were encouraged to go out into the community and he spoke to people in East Grinstead and it sort of became, they still call themselves the town that didn't stare, but encouraged this sort of group healing, which strangely took years after the Second World War to be introduced in other burns units for civilians. So I think um, what was being introduced after it, during and after the Second World War for um, pilots, primarily pilots, some people from the Navy as well, um, which would have been great to introduce in hospitals, um, wasn't introduced immediately. I thought I'd, I, I, ended, I added this a little later because um, I think keloids um, confused a lot of people. After the atomic bomb was dropped in Hiroshima and in Nagasaki as well, um, they noticed that after a few weeks, people who had been burned developed these, uh, these very, what they called sort of crab-like scars uh, and they tend to peak in the third month, and they were trying to explain what caused these. So this intense heat, the superficial burn, could develop into a, a, a very nasty scar that they hadn't really seen before. And what they also noticed is that, well, they had noticed these sorts of scars before. The other image that I have up there is of Gordon, a famous slave whose image was used during the abolitionist movement. A lot of slaves and their sort of whipped backs were also displayed in that sort of way to draw attention to their mistreatment. But uh, as a result of the atomic bomb, you had, a, a, I guess, a rediscovery of the keloid scars, and they recognized that these were much more common in non-white skin. Uh, so lots of theories coming out at the time uh, as to what caused them. Uh, and eventually, I mean, they still are having trouble explaining them, but again, uh, this idea of too much or a lot of collagen in the skin, so almost like a, a hyper healing sort of mode. Uh, the treatment for this in the 20th century was uh, with UV light, um, radium, and x-rays. So again, scars are only really being um, treated in different ways than surgery by, by the sort of second half of the of the 20th century, but they are, um, they are still the main challenge today. And I'm gonna finish in a few more slides, uh, just bringing that up to date and telling you just how important they, they are now in terms of the, the research and the, the work that's being done. But as, as I mentioned, uh, Birmingham Accident Hospital was one of the few hospitals that I knew of before uh, my appointment in Birmingham in 2000. They had set up a, 
a Medical Research Council funded burns unit there in uh, 1943. It was the last hospital um, set up before the uh, establishment of the NHS. So it was the last of the voluntary hospitals that was uh, originally set up. It was based on a, a model on the continent. Uh, it was specifically for fractures and other accidents. But the people who really went there and, 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 uh, and headed the units were originally from the Glasgow Burns unit. So the Glasgow Burns unit, I think, was really the first. I think there is an article in one of the medical journals saying that Edinburgh had a, a Burns unit in 1843. But when I went through the records here, it seems to have been a convenient way to take what they called stinking patients out of the wards. And they were mixed with other infectious cases. I think these are really the very first Burns units uh, in the UK. Uh, and by this time, of course, they were emphasizing domestic burns and mostly children, that about 50% of burns by the post-Second World War period are children with burns, and this is still pretty much common. Why they say that burns patients are not normal, I've sat in some of these meetings, I think, I think that's kind of, well... There, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of unusual patients that they get there. There are people who are burned when um, uh, under the influence of alcohol or other drugs, but I think burns are still in, in many ways um, affecting everyone at work, and, but mostly children. Um, they were seeing about 1,000 new cases annually, so this incredible concentration, and their, their real um, expertise was in preventing infection. So what the Glasgow unit had also done, they had developed some, some very effective treatments, but of course the sort of gram-negative bacteria that was often making the, the grafts um, hard to take or leading to sloughing off of the, the, the skin that was being um, uh, grafted onto burns, um, this is what they were they're having the greatest challenges with. So Pseudomonas uh, is it aeruginosa that was causing most of the complications by this time when penicillin was available? Um, so a lot of problems with the contractures still. And I, I mentioned this one famous case that, uh, that made the, the names of both the Glasgow and the Birmingham unit, because, uh, Mary H., who was observed in terms of the take of the pinch grafts and leading to Peter Medawar's uh, Nobel Prize. But I wanted to put this slide up there because there's a, lot, there's a tendency. I, th I think you must have gone through hundreds, maybe thousands of these dermatological atlases. And there's a tendency to use white skin and also faces. And I think one of the things that our project really wants to do is to take attention away from the face. Because actually, with the guinea pig club as well, most of the burns were on the hands and the legs and the arms. But there is something about scars on the face. And we tend to, there's, there's I think in most of the sort of campaigns for burns awareness, they, they tend to always, and we live in that sort of selfie world, don't we, where I think people are hyper-conscious now of the face. But I think one of the things to remember is the sort of difficulties that scarring on the hands can lead to, that a lot of the people that were going through the burns unit in Birmingham and Glasgow were retrained um, to do work, or they had their, their machinery from their work modified so that they could continue to work. Now, they might still have scarring on the face, but in order to earn their livings, a lot of them had to, had to have adjustments made in terms of the workplace, and, and uh, like this, this image here. Um, Leonard Colebrook, who ran the, ran the Burns unit in Birmingham, um, did some remarkable work. Colebrook is, is one of the people who was with Fleming at St. Mary's um, under the leadership of Almworth Wright. Uh, he's the one that sort of the unsung hero from that group. We don't know, his, but he was a very quiet guy. But he did a lot of important work in terms of uh, the control of infection. And he went to Glasgow and he helped set up the Burns unit there. And then he eventually went to Birmingham and he helped set up the Burns unit there. And he'd worked his entire life in Burns. And I think as you probably would, everybody here would probably come to the same conclusion, is after doing all this amazing work, you just wonder, why do we still see hundreds and thousands of people? Can't we prevent these burns? And this was particularly urgent because, as I said, so many of the patients were children. So his wife died during the war, and he met somebody who worked for the BBC, Vera Scoville, whose husband died in the war. And um, it's not exactly the best first date, but he did say, he took her into the Burns ward, and he said, try to look at these patients. 
And she did, and she found it very difficult. And clearly, you can see from the sort of quotes that I've picked up from his um, biography, so the idea of, you know, the trauma of the war was still there, that people had seen things when they liberated the camps, uh, the concentration camps, that, that made them think differently about, you know, what they could withstand in terms of, I mean, a Burns campaign today would never show the sort of images that Leonard Colbrook would, but he felt that this was what they had to do. So that in order to change the laws around what manufacturers had to do to make heating apparatus safer, for example, or to have nighties that weren't going to ignite when somebody sat too close to a fire, they needed to show the public what was happening. Um, again, he was predicting the worst for society at that time. That's why I have that atom bomb explosion there, that he was predicting that this would be the injury that we would have to deal with in the second half of the 20th century. The Cold War is in full swing. He felt there should be Burns units in every city across Europe, across Britain. Uh, but anyway, he would start by having this campaign and shocking people into um, changing the laws around uh, Burns. So the, the real sort of pressure was on the parents that the old legislation from 1908 suggested that if a child was burned in the home, the parents could be fined an additional 10 pounds. So they've gone through quite a tragedy in most cases, and then they could be additionally fined for the the injuries that their children sustained. And he was trying to get that changed and put the pressure on man, the, um, uh, the manufacturers, the, the politicians, so that when the Fire Guards Act came out in 1952, after he set up this sort of, these sorts of images were used in the, uh, in the House of Commons, and he sent out pamphlets to all the MPs. Uh, and eventually, legislation in 1952, 1964, was passed to make uh, electric heaters, um, uh, flannel 90s, these sorts of things, um, fireproof. Of course, we still have to deal with, I think, Halloween costumes, which I regularly see these, uh, these sorts of injuries happening still. But at least for the, the nightwear and, uh, and the heating apparatus, this hospital also managed to lead one of the most successful uh, prevention campaigns. But this sort of shock campaign disappeared by the 1970s. And I noticed, when I went to Hiroshima as well, I noticed about the same time the museum there started to remove all of the images which they were showing to stress the dangers of new, or the horrors of nuclear war. That uh, I think about the same time, people felt that we no longer had a tolerance for this kind of imagery. And I think one of the few areas that we still accept this is maybe for drunk driving. I see some really graphic drunk driving um, campaigns, but also the um, cigarette packages, I think two of the surviving shock campaigns still used for public health. But you can tell me if you can think of others, but this is how people were trying to improve um, or prevent uh, burns uh, in the 1950s and 60s. What we also notice is that a lot, of, a lot of the prevention campaigns, a lot of the medical publications were of white skin up until about the 1970s. Birmingham is a fairly diverse community, and the Burns unit was seeing people from all different backgrounds. Um, again, I'm trying to sort of draw attention to some of the unsung heroes as well. The, there's a, the image in the top right there is uh, Nurse Chang, who I know absolutely nothing about, who worked at the former workhouse in Birmingham, the Dudley Road Hospital, and who said he had seen enough of these children being brought into hospital with horrific burns. Um, so again, you start to see their images appear in the Burns textbooks. So Muir and Barclay um, and, uh, and J.S. Kaysen's textbooks, I think Muir and Barclay were seen as the Bible for Burns units around uh, the UK. But Kaysen was, uh, was one of the surgeons at the Birmingham Burns unit, was particularly good at including uh, children from, from uh, diverse backgrounds. Uh, again, the iconic King's Cross fire, you know, the most, uh, um, the highest mortality in a, in a sort of a, a, an underground uh, accident uh, in, in, in its history. Um, and the person who, who we tended to see in the newspapers was Quasi Minta. Again, his face was in all the newspapers, but he was a musician. And it was his fingers that he um, spoke about most in the interviews, but we saw his face. 
and the pressure mask that was meant to reduce the scarring. And that, of course, that kind of mask is still used today. Katie Piper wore one. Um, if you're wearing one of those in the, in the sort of months following a burn, um, you can usually wear it for up to two years or so, but you're wearing it for about 23 out of 24 hours a day. Um, so again, there's something about the sort of look that people um, recognize the, or are, are drawn to the face. I think there was, a, there was another a famous rail accident uh, in London where, again, one particular patient was the spoke, or patient, one particular um, individual was the, the spokesperson for the accident because they were wearing a pressure mask. But again, um, interesting when you, when you uh, see interviews with these people that they do mention, often the, the scarring is not just to the face, it often involves the fingers, and it's much more traumatic in how it affects their, their, um, their, their recovery. Uh, he mentions in particular his voice being scarred. Um, anyone with burns will have much more difficulty sort of regulating their temperature, um, so they talk about that. Uh, but interestingly, he also blames this uh, accident for the autism that his son has. And of course, this, is, this isn't connected to burns, but it is interesting how this idea that I've been talking about, the, 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 the scarring for donor skin, um, the other ways that the, the, the burn scar is transferred to, to other people, but some people still talking about the trauma and the, the potential impact that has. And of course, we talk, I mean, there's a, an emotional scar to burns. Burns are basically two wounds. We talk about a physical injury and we talk about um, a, an emotional one. Now, I think the whole story of burns changes significantly in, uh, in the last decades of the 20th century. That's Alan Breslau, um, beside uh, James Partridge's um, book, Changing Faces. He set up the Phoenix Society in America, the first civilian burns society. So again, just look at the dates too. He was, he was injured in an, uh, in a, in a, in an uh, airplane fire, a crash in 1963, and eventually in 1977, he set up the Phoenix Society. Interesting how he talks about his scars. Um, he thinks that standing out from the crowd or standing out from crowds is an advantage. Um, in his biography, uh, he says that his life has been enhanced. Not something that most people would say, but I think you tend to see that in a lot of activists' writing, that burns are worn as a sort of a badge of honor. Um, James Partridge, of course, uh, was driving a car in Wales um, in 1970. Uh, he took, uh, I think it was the, the on-ramp to a motorway a little too quickly, and this van ended up on its side, and there was a fire. Um, and again, he had a very difficult and long recovery. And it was only at the King's Cross fire that he was encouraged to speak about his burns. Uh, he didn't really talk about the accident, but the fact that he was burned, visibly burned. He, doesn't use, he didn't use words like disfigured. He didn't like the dis words. And he made us think about burn scars very differently. And I put him on this slide because he was hugely helpful in our project. I corresponded with him quite regularly until, until he died of cancer uh, two years ago. But, um, you know, he, he, was, he said some very interesting things about scarring as well. He said a lot of people see the surgery as getting back to normal. And he says, what you really need is you need sufficient surgery to recover your poise, not your looks. So you'll never recover the looks again, but you need maybe some different training, assertiveness training. He had a lot of confidence. He came from a different class background from many of the other patients we looked at. He had, he had that confidence already. But again, personality, age, luck, education, income, he says are all connected to resilience. And that's that word we use a lot today when we talk about recovery stories like this. But he says in typical James fashion, he said it's still bloody difficult, especially if you're scarred like he was. So what's interesting is that before this time, most people would talk about Burns victims. And it was this group of people that really changed the way we talk about Burns survivors today. That survive, the way that the word survivor has been picked up, I think, didn't come from the medical profession. It was these sorts of people who led the way and spoke about themselves as survivors. And James Partridge, of course, started a facial equality. I mean, racial equality, facial equality is meant to sound similar. He started that campaign in 2008, and he went sort of international with that campaign. And it wasn't about how can we improve surgery for people with burns. It was about how can we change the way that society thinks about burns. 
And that was the sort of place he left his campaign when, when he died in, uh, in the summer two years ago. The Katie Piper Foundation, I mean, we also, in Britain is interesting for that reason. You don't have these sorts of figures in Canada. Not every country has these very public individuals talking about scarring um, and burns, for example. But here you have another individual. She was a model um, trying to develop that side of her career. She says in her bio, one of her many biographies, she wouldn't leave the house with a spot on her face. And then she had to deal with leaving the house with um, acid burns. So the hers were, of course, intentional. So 5% of burns today tend to be intentional. So very different from James Partridge's. When her initial book, Beautiful, her bio autobiography was written, Beautiful, she had 60 operations and she wore a pressure mask. When she wrote Beautiful Ever After, she describes her burn psychologist more, something that James Partridge didn't have to assist him. He spoke to a cleaning lady in the wards and she helped him recover his poise. But uh, she had a psychologist, and by 2015, when that second autobiography came out, she had 250 operations. There have been documentaries. She's run lots of scar clinics for other people. She regularly talks about her doctor, Dr. Jawad, who gave her back her face. And although she says she wore her disfigurement as a badge of honor, you can see that there's a very different approach to burns and disfigurement in what she writes. So two charities but they tell very different stories. Changing faces is about changing people's views on scars. And you have another one which really has been embraced by the plastic surgeons who can see that here's an individual who feels that there is a role for surgery rather than changing society's views. Now, I think she would say that's not fair because I think they also say that people should, you know, think twice about staring and these sorts of things. But I think that's, that was central to Changing Faces campaign. And here you have an organization. So you have almost two charities and two bookends, two very different ways of looking at Burns. And I think that's important because of what's happened since, is that in, when the King's Cross fire happened in 1987, a lot of those um, injured with Burns went to um, UCL. The, 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 UCL uh, ho Hospital, um, and that's not the name for it, it's, it escaped him for the moment, where a Michael Brow was uh, working. And he afterwards set up the Phoenix Appeal, and he wanted to set up the first department of plastic surgery. And the very first professor of plastic surgery was appointed there, Gus McGrother, who has since been he's a Glasgow graduate, who then went to London, who went to Manchester, and is now uh, in Birmingham. Um, and his his uh, foundation that he set, set up after uh, launching the Phoenix Appeal became the Healing Foundation. And as a result of the Healing Foundation's funding, we have our Burns Unit in Birmingham, which encouraged the project that I'm working on now. When I attended their Burns Congress in 2013, I was just fascinated at how far Burns surgery had come. And they've linked that Burns Unit with the Bristol Appearance Research Unit and, again, uh, the unit at UCL. So working together to improve uh, outcomes for people burned. Um, but the, the Healing Foundation changed its name in 2016 to the Scar Free Foundation, which was a shock to the Bristol appearance research people because they felt that it didn't quite meet up with their mission, which is that mission that Changing Faces was really pushing, to, to change the way that people think about those disfigured with burns injuries. Um, so again, I think that leaves us at a really interesting point where we are today, that the Scar Free Foundation exists, and most of the funding is now going towards improving uh, outcomes in terms of uh, scarring. And on the other hand, you have this mission that people like Changing Faces were pushing and which they embraced films like Wonder, I believe it was, and some of the children's books that you brought along tonight where children will learn to think about Burns differently. I think those two sort of missions that are going on at the moment are really nice bookends in one way, but you can see that it divides the, the community of, of patients and those working with those with Burns uh, uh, today. Um, what else is on that I wanted to show? I included that portrait of um, Simon Weston because, again, you might know him as a very prominent individual with scars. 
Um, but when his uh, portrait was chosen um, to be uh, hung in the uh, in the National Portrait Gallery, I think it was a, it's a it's a very nice portrait actually. But uh, again, I think that's an, a pivotal moment. I think in the way we think about um, burned scars, and I can't imagine him having more operations and having another portrait painted. But that is the way I think he'll go down and being remembered in the uh, in the collection. Anyway, conclusions, there's always loads, and I try and put a few on there. You might have your own, but again, I think Burns clearly mark the body as an accident. They are ones that leave a legacy, and bodies can be read in all sorts of ways that I've tried to do in this talk, and there's a diversity to Burns depending on what you work, uh, what you did work, or what people worked in the past. There are those that, that people describe as heroic Burns, badges of honor, those that sometimes are caused in war, uh, sometimes those that are worn afterwards by those who come to the rescue, the first responders. Um, but the experience and the narratives, we only have those much more recently when these Burns activists really wrote about their recoveries in order to inspire other people who had similar um, injuries uh, and didn't have the initial support of groups like the Guinea Pig Club. Uh, but you can see that Burns, and they continue to be very stigmatizing, they draw attention, but so do lots of injuries and diseases worn on the skin. Uh, they are broadcast, they're broadcast, yeah, they're depicted and widely, shared widely, they're there for all to see, as you can see from the exhibition here. So there's living with scars or a scar-free future. I think what that, why that, that debate between the Scar-Free Foundation and the changing faces is so interesting to me is because it kind of picks up on the debates within the disability community as well. This idea that we can, we can cure disability, but that where does that leave people who have learned to live with their disability? Anyway, I've decided to also put um, some first aid tips on there uh, because of course we shouldn't put butter and things like that on burns and it seems that it's not 10 minutes under cold water now that is being recommended, but 20 minutes. Uh, it says, call for help. This, is, um, uh, this was the, the, the Children's Burns Trust who helped me uh, update this, uh, this uh, advice. And then they recommend covering burns uh, with something like cling film now, because it is sterile, and you can just roll off a piece, and not to apply ice, butter, toothpaste, creams, bandages, oil, and all the things that they still continue to see in A&E departments. Um, stop, drop, and roll I put up there, because it is one of these amazing prevention mottos that has have really caught on, and we've traced that back historically as well. And you do see it appear in around the 1860s in some of the medical journals, and it's in a response to a lot of women wearing um, dresses that are catching fire, balls, or ballerinas whose outfits are catching fire, and they're advising them to stop, well, not in those exact words, but to drop and to roll. Um, and again, it's advice that the, the people I've met in Burns units say they just wish people would um, follow because it's why they still see these sorts of injuries where the chins are being fused to the chest because people, there's a tendency, I guess, for most people to run in panic. They said, if we stop, drop, and roll, then there's also certain burns that we won't be seeing, certain scarring that I showed you here that we wouldn't be seeing as a result. <laughs> Thank you for listening to this Case Notes podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, click like, or leave a positive review or comment. We really appreciate it because it helps us get higher in the rankings and reach more people. Thank you.